Can I still be using the presentation at all? No. Okay. No, 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 no. It's not my cake. It's Valerie's cake. Colleagues, good afternoon. And those who are joining us online, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world. It's good to see all of you here face to face and I can recognize Dani behind the mask. Welcome, Dani. It's, it's good for you to join us. It makes us, reminds us of the good old days. So thank you. I, other people, I can't recognize people behind the masks, but uh, let me say welcome and good evening. Good, good evening, Mulweni, Sanbonani, Dumelang. Uh, welcome all of you to the Wilson Memorial Lecture. My name, if you haven't uh, noticed or they haven't told you, is Mamukheti Paking, and I'm the Vice Chancellor of the University of Cape Town. I'm going to act as your host for today. Um, and I share the podium this evening with the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, Associate Professor Lionel Green Thompson, who will introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Valerie Mizrahi, the Director of the Institute for Infectious Diseases and Molecular Medicine. Let me also welcome two previous directors of the IDM who are with us this evening, the founding director, Emeritus Professor Vilan Givers. I think Vilan is joining us online. And Emeritus Professor Greg Hassi. Greg, welcome. Is Vilan here? Ah, Vilan, yes. Good to see you. Good to see you. That's why I thought the masks hide people. So it's really, really nice to see you. Welcome. And Emeritus Professor Gregory Hassi. Greg, welcome as well. And thank you so much for joining us. The Wolfson Memorial Lecture was established in 2012 to honor the many generous contributions to UCT by the late Lord Wolfson of Marie Le Bon and the Wolfson Foundation. This evening's hybrid event takes place physically here in the Wolfson Pavilion, now home to the Institute of, Infect of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine on our medical campus. This gathering honors the strong partnership between the University of Cape Town and the Wolfson Foundation and our shared commitment to the pursuit of excellence in education and research. We extend a special welcome to Mr. Paul Ramsbottom, Director of the Wolfson Foundation, who's joining us online. Thank you so much, um, Paul, for joining us. The hard work of the research and health sciences community globally and here at UCT has made it possible for some of us to gather in person for events like this. We have planned this event to draw on the best of both worlds. An opportunity for those of us in the pavilion to meet face to face as, as our nationwide COVID-19 vaccination program takes effect while live streaming to a wider audience of friends and partners globally who cannot be in Cape Town tonight or who may prefer not to participate in a physical meeting. This year, UCT continued to climb in the international university rankings and we lead African universities in four major world university rankings. We also excelled in several subject rankings and were ranked in the top 100 for six subjects, including an outstanding top 10 for infectious diseases. Much of UCT's work in infectious diseases takes place within the world leading Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine, or IDM, which is ably led by Professor Valerie Misrahi. UCT's placement in the top 10 in infectious diseases is a testament to our position as a global leader in the fields of HIV, TB, and HIV-associated TB. Tonight's event takes place as we continue to face the challenges posed by the global COVID-19 pandemic, which has impacted every country in the world. The virus presents particular challenges on the African continent where unequal access to health care serves to deepen poverty and inequality. The topic of Professor Mizrahi's lecture tonight is planning ahead for research impact, reflections from a decade as director of the IDM, and reflects on, the topic, on, a, on a topic that is at the heart of our vision for UCT in the 21st century a university which, which tackles the most difficult problems that confronts us as a country, as a continent, and does, not, does so with vigor. I've spoken before about the tension that is created when we aspire to be a world-class university in a society that remains profoundly unequal. 
and we have to continue managing the tension between responding to the local imperatives whilst we pursue or we, we continue to be a globally impactful institution. However, the work of Professor Mizrahi and her colleagues and students in the IDM demonstrates convincingly that we can overcome this contradiction or this tension through excellence in research that responds to a significant local challenge while contributing to a body of knowledge with, relevant in, with relevance internationally. As we reach the end of a very challenging year, it is wonderful to reflect on the ongoing work of the IDM. It takes great courage to choose as one once research focus the most difficult and pernicious problems that face us in the South African, in South, Af in so South African public health. Professor Mizrahi has dedicated her career to advancing our understanding of HIV and tuberculosis and their treatment. And so it is an honor today to hear from her and I look forward to listening from her, for, from learning from her strength. In many ways, it's a celebration because we'll hear about the 10 years of the IDM from one of its formidable directors. We'll get to celebrate that as we celebrate the groundbreaking work that has been done from that center, but also the groundbreaking work that continues to come out of UCT. I'll now call on Associate Professor Lionel Green-Thompson to introduce Professor Val Mizrahi. Thank you. Thank you very much, VC, for that, for dealing with some of the um, acclaim that the Institute brings to the faculty. But greetings, colleagues, to all of you, and I would acknowledge all of the people that the VC has greeted at the beginning of her, her remarks. I want to those reserve a special greeting to Professor Mizrahi's mother, Etty, who's online, and her two daughters, Natalie and Danny, who also join us online this afternoon. In many ways, my position in this evening is in the tradition of the Mbongi, those who sing the praises of heroes. But when we celebrate our story, the story of this 110-year-old faculty, they are legends of which we will speak in hushed tones because of their capacity for scholarship and the extent to which they imagine new ideas for scientific progress and the progress of our people. We'll speak in bolder tones to tell of their contribution to the source of life in this Faculty of Health Sciences through their growth of other people and their nurturing of future leaders. In louder clarion calls, we will celebrate leadership and the capacity to connect with the most junior of novice scholars, as well as the most celebrated and pioneering scholars internationally. We may eventually sing fireside songs with drum rolls as we tell of the commitment of a woman scholar to the African continent and to the abiding transformation of our society. In the words of the earliest people of this place, the place they call Kamirori Chais, they call this place the place of the stars. This lecture this evening, Professor Mizrahi, celebrates the constellation of our stars tonight. The gift of deep and abiding relationships which allow partnerships such as that with the Wolfson Foundation, to grow and to, better, and to create a better world. It offers us an opportunity to celebrate the constellation of stars that gather in the IDM and continue to produce work and knowledge that changes what we think globally. But it's also an evening to celebrate the spirit of an individual whose story tells of formidable tenacity and a grace which imbues this faculty with the sense of purpose. It is, this, it is in this celebration of this place of the stars that we are able to repeat the call of those women of the 50s whose actions gave rise to the acclamation, Ika Malama Kosigazi, Malibongwe, for the names of the women we give thanks. And so it is in this moment we give thanks for a woman like Professor Mizrahi, whose contribution will stand for generations to come and whose star has shone across the globe bringing honor to this house and to its people. Professor Valerie Mizrahi is the Professorial Director of the Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine here in our faculty at the University of Cape Town. 
She also directs an extramural research unit of the South African Medical Research Council as is, and is the founding co-director of the DSI NRF Center of Excellence for Biomedical TB, TB Research. She is a former international research scholar and senior international re research scholar of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute of the United States of America. She was based at the WITS NHLS School of Pathology for 22 years before moving to UCT in 2011. And I have to recall with fondness the moments when I thought of her leaving because at that stage, Valerie was a, an integral part of the landscape at WITS at the time. And so we all noted her, her departure from that space. Professor Mizrahi obtained her PhD in chemistry here from UCT in 1983, but is a recognized leader in TB research with an A1 rating from the NRF, the National Research Foundation. Her research focuses on aspects of the physiology and metabolism of, of mycobacterium tuberculosis relevant to TB drug discovery and mycobacterial persistence. She has published more than 170 original research articles, reviews, and book chapters in the fields of organic chemistry, enzymology, and mycobacterial genetics, physiology, and biochemistry. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology, of the African Academy of Science, the Royal Society of South Africa, an associate fellow of the World Academy of Science, and a member of the Academy of Science of South Africa. Valerie is well recognized globally and include and, and has amongst her awards the 2000 UNESCO L'Oreal for Women in Science Award, Africa and the Middle East, a gold medal from the South African Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, the DST Women in Science Award, the 2013 Christophe Moreau Prize from the Moreau Foundation, the Order of the Mapungubwe Silver in 2007, a Platinum Award from the South African Medical Research Council and the 2018 Harry Oppenheimer Fellowship. Valerie is a member of numerous scientific advisory boards locally and abroad. She has trained more than 70 postgraduate students and postdoctoral fellows, some of whom have moved into leadership positions in South Africa and further afield. And she's also mentored or sponsored many other early career researchers. It is a singular honor this evening to welcome Professor Val Mizrahi to deliver the 2021 M Wolfson Memorial Lecture. Welcome, Val. Thank you so much, Hetty, for those beautiful words of introduction. And Lionel, you almost had me in tears, uh, acknowledging my mom. Hi, mom. Um, today, I want to share with you Oh, that's the wrong way of doing it. Okay, guys. Um, do I do that? Uh, yeah. There we go. Um, I am going to be telling you a, a narrative of what I've learned, what we've done in the Institute over the last 10 years. And it is a singular honor to be presenting this Wolfson Memorial Lecture in the Wolfson Pavilion, which was established as, as our Vice Chancellor has, has described, uh, thanks to a major donation from the Wolfson Foundation that led to the establishment of what was called the IIDMM with a different logo. Uh, we simplified the acronym to the IDM in 2013, and it is a singular delight to have Vilant Gervas and Greg Hussey in the audience today. And when we had our 10th anniversary in 2014, we established plaques in pride of place in the Institute, in the Wolfson Pavilion, acknowledging their massive contributions uh, as founder and interim director and as first director of the Institute. So what is the IDM? Well, we aim to be a place where scientists work together to tackle diseases of importance in Africa and we work at the intersection of the lab, the clinic and the community. And our mission has four elements to do research, 
to use research as a vehicle to develop people, to translate our, our research into policy and practice, and to work together with others in partnership. And our values mirror those of the university and the faculties to which we belong, health sciences and the science faculty. We are a large postgraduate cross-faculty research institute at UCT. We are based and draw our members from health sciences and the faculty of science from nine academic departments and the centerpiece of the Institute are the 46 full and associate members who do all of the research under the Institute and run their own research groups. And we are strengthened and enriched by some brilliant scientists elsewhere at UCT who are our affiliate members, as well as some leading scientists from across the world who are our adjunct members of this Institute. And what we do is provide Institute-wide support. And this notion of support as an enabler of research will be a theme throughout my presentation. We are geographically quite distributed. Here we are on the Health Sciences campus across the road from the famous Hrutuskir Hospital, but our three large clinical groups, SATVI, SIDRI Africa, and the Desmond Tutu HIV Center, run clinical research sites across peri-urban townships in and around Cape Town, and as far afield as Masi Pumalele, all the way out to Worcester. We collaborate extensively across the world and each of the blue dots on this map represents a point of collaboration with someone from the Institute collaborating with someone abroad. We collaborate within the country and continent, across the global south and across the rest of the world. Zooming in on Africa, we have built very considerable partnerships with other African institutions across southeastern Africa into West Africa and some of the Africa-led initiatives that I will touch on during this presentation have enabled us to really build a powerful platform collaborating and occupying our place on the African continent. So what are the diseases that we work on of importance in Africa? They fall into five themes. These are shown in separate boxes, but in fact, they are tight, tightly interlinked with one another. And we have a number of research themes which, within each of those disease, disease areas. But very importantly, what the Institute does is provide Institute-wide support through cross-cutting platforms that are either technology-based or discipline-based. You'll hear a lot about genomics and bioinformatics, and we have a bespoke and world-class Biosafety Level 3 laboratory in which we do our work around tuberculosis. Uh, one of the major achievements during my term was the, uh, was the creation of the first and only Welcome Centre that was created outside of the UK. This is the Welcome Centre for Infectious Diseases Research in Africa called Sidri Africa under the leadership of Honorary Professor Robert Wilkinson. Uh, the objectives and the intent, the strategic intent of Sidri Africa aligns with that of the Institute. And most of the investigators and co-investigators belong to the Institute, so we work very closely together using data science, using basic science and clinical research as our platforms. And again, what we share in common is this notion of investing in people who provide research support. In terms of research productivity, and impact. Here is a graph showing our growth since 2004. Our members of the Institute community have published some 3,800 publications, 3,000 since 2011. These have garnered many citations, 150,000, and as the Vice Chancellor has explained, we rank particularly highly in infectious diseases at UCT, with the IDM being a significant contributor, but certainly not the sole contributor. We also have more than half of UCT's top innovators who are filing patents belong to this institute. So our research is aimed and tightly interlinked uh, with, with, with innovation. I'm now going to run through a series of vignettes and I need to explain why I've selected these. Obviously, reading through 3,000 papers is a monumental task. I have decided to pick vignettes that epitomize our vision, our mission, and our values. And I've also paid a lot of attention to what is being led from the Institute. I feel very strongly as an institute in Africa, we need to claim our position of leadership. So I've selected vignettes that illustrate 
leadership. And for those who are listening who are not scientists, you just need to look at who the first authors are, who the last authors are. And much of our work, as I've said, has been done in collaboration. As the name, in, uh, the name of our institute has uh, infectious disease in it, so it stands to reason that the centerpiece of where we excel is in world-class expertise in understanding and intervening in infectious diseases. And the apex of intervention is to run clinical trials and to run clinical studies. These are four very highly cited papers that epitomize the work in these fields. The top two, and all of these, by the way, are the work that come out of these phenomenal research centers that fall under the umbrella of the Institute. The top two are arguably the most important publications in the field of TB vaccinology for decades. They have given hope to the concept of being able to do better than the BCG vaccine, largely out of the work of SATV, but with major con uh, contributions from SIDRI and DTHC. The HIV research strength of this institute long predates the creation of the IDM. And here I must pay great credit to Linda Gale Becker and the Desmond Tutu HIV Center. Linda Gale has worked closely with Glenda Gray, the president of the MRC. She's in fact an adjunct member of this institute. They have collaborated enormously on HIV vaccine research through the HIV vaccine trial network funded by the US National Institutes of Health, but are known as this dynamic duo who brought the Sisonke trial to South Africa and have given hope and help to healthcare workers through vaccination against COVID. And here's another important paper, the HIV, uh, the Desmond Tutu HIV Center works on treatment for HIV. Our a very important clinical trial that I want to highlight is the PREDART trial. This is the work of the great Graham Mankeys. What PREDART did is demonstrate a role for this cheap anti-inflammatory drug called prednisone in reducing the risk of tuberculosis iris. What is this condition? It is a condition where a person who's taking TB drugs and has HIV then goes on to antiretroviral therapy and the reconstitution of the immune system results in a cytokine kind storm with dire consequences for the individual. So it's paradoxical, two life-saving therapies can be so harmful together. And so this study has had global impact. It has been picked up and changed policy in the US Centers for Disease Control and the EACS, the European AIDS Clinical Society. This is impact of research coming out of the work here. The next vignette I want to share epitomizes this concept of the power of working community engaged with clinical research and laboratory. And when I stood right here 12 years ago interviewing for this job with Marion Jacobs, who's here, and Dani Fisser, I made the point that strength in clinical research needs strong laboratories. And this work coming out of the SATV group, again, very highly cited publication up here, has in fact its origins in work that was led by Greg Hussey, who not only was the director of the institute, he was also the director of SATV. What did they do? They set up a cohort study of adolescents, tracking young people to see who would get infected with the TB bacterium and who would develop disease. And then using blood samples maintained and collected through that cohort, they were able to go and analyze expression levels of genes and found a signature that was diagnostic of a risk of developing tuberculosis. And a sub-signature of that, the so-called RISC-11, 11, 11 gene signature was subsequently run, used as a biomarker to ask the question of whether we can do biomarker-guided tuberculosis um, preventive therapy. In other words, Individuals who are at risk of developing TB could benefit, and this is the so-called Cortis trial led by Mark Hatherall, and all of this work has been led by Tom Scriber, who is here in the audience. Huge collaboration. This is the principle of how we work together across the country, the continent, and across the world. Our collaborative research in TB and HIV is extended beyond the clinic, looking into the laboratory. We've done a lot of work asking how the intersection of these two pathogens can influence the way in which the TB bacterium, mycobacterium tuberculosis, I think I've slipped one slide. Uh, um, uh, sorry, 
I, I'm, I'm going ahead of myself here. I'm so rehearsed on my slide that I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, here, I wanted to touch, in fact, on the question of, of uh, HIV research. This is in the area of, uh, of laboratory science. Much of our work has been in close collaboration with the group in Caprisa, out of Durban, led by Salim Abdul Karim. And I'm highlighting two papers here that illustrate the power of doing laboratory science on good clinical cohorts. The first is the work of Melissa Rose Abrams with Carolyn Williamson, aiming to address questions regarding the HIV reservoir. And what they have shown here is that most of the long-lived replication competent reservoir is formed at the time that a person develops, uh, goes on to antiretroviral therapy. And Shirazan Ismail, working with Wendy Burgers and another team of dynamic women, have identified immunological correlates of the HIV replication competent reservoir size. This kind of information is of crucial importance in achieving the aspirational goal of HIV cure. This is what we are aiming to do in HIV. Now, UCT is very strong in clinical medicine, and I want to highlight here a landmark paper that highlighted the role of PET-CT imaging, a whole body imaging modality, as a key tool for experimental studies in tuberculosis. This is the work of Hanif Esmail working with Robert Wilkinson and others, including Cliff Barry, a world-leading TB scientist who's an adjunct member of this institute and has a lab here. And what they were able to show is that in individuals who are HIV positive and had not been on antiretroviral therapy, they found lung abnormalities that were detected by PET-CT indicative of so-called subclinical tuberculosis. And this is an example of a slew of papers that have totally turned the world of our understanding on TB on its head. When we used to think of TB as binary, latent and active, now we think of it as uh, we think of it as a spectrum. And it is this PET-C, this kind of research done in close collaboration with Stellenbosch that led me to work together with my close friend and collaborator and colleague, the great professor in Tobeko and Tusi, who I know is listening in from Kenya today. We worked together to establish a PET-CT facility at UCT with generous funding from the Gates Foundation, from Aspen and from TIA. This was launched exactly two years ago, Vice Chancellor, you will probably remember this, and is being used widely, not only areas of research, including cancer chemotherapy. Now, our work around tuberculosis has moved very extensively into the area of TB transmission. And here is a landmark study from the Desmond Tutu group that studied TB transmission in a South African community with high prevalence of HIV. This is in the township of, of Masipumalele. And this is the work of Karen Middlecoop, who showed that most TB uh, is, is due to recent infection. And this is happening in people who have HIV, whether or not they are receiving antiretroviral therapy. And the work of TB transmission has had a huge boost recently uh, through the area of the, the field of research known as aerobiology of tuberculosis. And this I would hold as the most significant interdisciplinary collaboration established in this institute with funding, generous funding from the MRC. And what this work entails is understanding the aerobiology of the organism by, of, of, of TB transmission by analyzing so-called bioaerosol. What is the bioaerosol? It is what we produce when we speak, when we sing, when we shout, when we cough. Capturing that material and analyzing it is what this pioneering study did. And each of these little oblong uh, rod-shaped things is a live TB bacillus that is being analyzed by single cell microbiology. And what is particularly exciting about this field of work is that Robin Wood in De Desmond Tutu HIV Foundation has established a bespoke laboratory in Masipumalele, which our vice chancellor opened about two and a half years ago. To, it's called the Aerobiology Research Center. And it's a brilliant example of taking our science and our laboratories into the community. And so this, this image over here, this is a, a personalized clean room in which an individual suspected of having TB has this cone-shaped device placed over their face. They breathe, they cough, they talk. Uh, and the bioaerosol through very sophisticated engineering is captured. And instead of transporting that bioaerosol for analysis here in the Institute, some 30 kilometers away, all the analysis is done 
in Masipumalele in a state-of-the-art research facility. This is the future of biomedical research from my perspective. And so when Ryan Dinkel, a brilliant graduate PhD student, presented some of his new work at a major TB audience from the New York Times, and the story was told on the front page of the New York Times on the 21st of October about upending centuries of dogma about TB. And we now think that breathing, per se, is as much of a risk factor of TB transmission than coughing. And I'm very excited that that work has come out of here. Now, our work on TB and HIV extends way beyond the clinic into understanding the evolution of the TB bacillus. And these are two great examples illustrating how HIV can change the ecology and the evolutionary trajectory of the TB bacterium. And this particular study providing tantalizing evidence of different types of selective pressure on the TB bacillus, whether it is harbored in an individual who's HIV positive or not. And then more recently, Helen Cox working with Rob Warren and others at Stellenbosch University and, and colleagues at the University of Basel provided evidence to suggest that HIV in fact can contribute to rifampicin resistance acquisition during first-line TB treatment, understanding that rifampicin is one of the frontline drugs for tuberculosis. Now, TB has been a big theme in the Institute here. Uh, we do a lot of work in TB drug discovery through two groups in the Institute, my own. Uh, so I have had some really outstanding researchers. We've worked in big international consortia. And what we've done is identify and validate new targets for tuberculosis drug discovery. And the second group in the Institute is led by the very famous Kelly Chibali, who is a member of this institute. And what his lab has done is identify new molecules, new chemical series that have anti-TB activity. Very tellingly, both Kelly and I are members or represent UCT twice on the TB Drug Accelerator. This is the world's largest consortium that pulls together groups from pharma companies and academic labs to work together to really drive tuberculosis drug discovery by maximizing synergies and minimizing overlap. The work on the aerobiology of TB and our work on TB drug discovery, very importantly, is underpinned by strength in basic science. And we must remember the importance of basic science as an, as a, as an enabler of applied science. And here I want to feature the work of an extraordinary student, and I name him here Tim DeVette, because he will be the very first student who will graduate with both a PhD degree and an MBCHB degree through the program that our late Dean, Professor Bongani Mayosi, it was his vision to create this intercalated program. Tim's getting his PhD uh, from the Vice Chancellor in two weeks time and his medical qualification and uh, this time next year. And what he has done is, is, is to ask the question using powerful genetic tools, what happens to the shape of a close relative of the TB bacillus. If you put it under stress, the stress imposed in these images here is stress caused by interference with the ability to build the cell envelope of the bacterium. And the normal shape of these bugs is that they're long rods, and you see they go short and fat. And so what Tim has done, working together with Digby Warner, my close colleague in the audience tonight, is, is really develop and help to train a new generation of brilliant young PhD students who have created an atlas of shapes, which are now being used as a tool for elucidating drug mechanisms of action in TB. Now, UCT is, of course, very famous for the work that Kelly Chibali has led through H3D in malaria uh, drug discovery and development. And there are so many firsts here, it's almost impossible to remember what to say about Kelly and his team, other than this paper over here uh, describes the very first drug developed in Africa and has gone all the way from discovery right the way through to first in human trials. And Karen Barnes is here in the audience and she was responsible for doing some of these trials on the African continent. Kelly's team continue to look for new anti-malarial agents uh, that are active against Plasmodium falciparum, the pathogen that causes malaria in humans. And like the TB drug accelerator, the Gates Foundation has a malaria drug accelerator, which H3D participates in as one of 15 top laboratories in the world to accelerate 
uh, malaria drug discovery. Now, our work in drug discovery also goes into the nasty superbug pathogens, which Kelly Chabali's lab works on as well, but also into non-communicable diseases. In the area of hypertension, Ed Sturrock is a leader in this field, and in fact, the research here and the strength here at UCT goes back to the time that Professor Wieland Givers created the Department of Medical Biochemistry at UCT. And here's some exciting new work. What we're looking at here is a protein structure with small molecule inhibitors in there. So there's structural biology, mechanistic enzymology underpinning this work, which has been a, a great collaboration between Ed and a brilliant young researcher, Lauren Orenser, who is now in Kelly Chibali Center. In addition to HIV and T and, and TB, we also work in plasmodium, we also work on many other pathogens, nasty pathogens, uh, a parasit a parasitic organisms, fungal pathogens, as well as helminths. These are worm infections and sexually transmitted infections. And here I want to highlight the work of a, a great young researcher, Alicia, uh, Alicia Chetty, who works together with Bill Horsnell and has published a really important paper recently that has demonstrated a role that intestinal worm infections common in sub-Saharan Africa put at risk African sub-Saharan African women for increased risk for sexually transmitted viral infections. And the whole field of sexually transmitted infections represents one of these massive growth areas of the Institute, led by a dynamic team of Heather Jaspin, who splits her time between here, UCT, and Seattle Children's uh, in the US, and Joanne Parsmore. And as part of a big team of researchers, they published an important study recently uh, that described data from a randomized trial looking at the effects of different kinds of, uh, of contraception, uh, of contraceptive tools uh, on the adolescent female genital microbiome. What is the microbiome? It is the community of microbes that sit in a particular location. Here we're talking about the, the, the vaginal tract. And they've also looked at inflammation that can occur as a result of sexually transmitted infections. And here is another great example of translating basic laboratory findings now into a new tool into a prototype diagnostic that is called GIFT, the genital inflammation tool, again underpinned by core funding that came from the MRC through the SHIP program. And what GIFT does is it, it measures the levels of certain inflammatory markers, immunological markers, and if they are elevated, you can ascertain that the woman is has, has in, genital inflammation puts that individual at risk of acquiring HIV. And this is due to um, undiagnosed and untreated sexually transmitted infections. So this is a great example of translation, not into policy, but into practice. Our research in infection biology extends into intersection with neurosciences. Here are two papers. This is Tiro Brambacher working with Frank Brambacher under the auspices of the ICGB, who we host here in the Institute, showing interestingly in involvement of molecules that are associated with infection, showing their association in cognitive function. And this has implications for conditions such as HIV associated dementia. And here, Muazam Jacobs with a dynamic group of young researchers in his team have shown a role for another cytokine tumor necrosis factor and its necessity for conferring protective immunity to TB of the central nervous system. Our translational work in TB moves uh, from also the laboratory into clinical trials. This is the work uh, led by Suraj Parihar and others that showed that statins, drugs that many of us take to reduce blood cholesterol levels, can in fact be used as host-directed therapies for tuberculosis, making the efficacy of known TB drugs better. And there is a trial that is underway at the moment with colleagues in the Cape Heart Institute and University of Zurich, convened by Reto Gula, called the Statin TB trial, asking exactly this question. And I'm delighted that the PET-CT scanner is being used for that study. Now, given this background that I've portrayed around infection biology with a couple of vignettes, it stood to reason that our researchers were poised to pivot into COVID-19 research. 
on that fateful day of the 5th of March 2020 when the first case was diagnosed in South Africa. And there are a couple of features of our COVID research that I think are notable. Firstly, in this paper led by Catherine Ryu, illustrates how our researchers are able to build their own assays and their own diagnostic tools in-house. And so using technology from TB applied to COVID in this particular study, and that has been used in a large study looking at the intersection of HIV, tuberculosis, and COVID-19, three nasty diseases coincident in our country as we speak. This study it epitomizes the beauty of collaboration. When you bring T-cell immunologists from our institute, Wendy Burgers in this case, together with a brilliant B-cell immunologist, Penny Moore and Tandeka Moyo Guete from NICD and Witz University, together with Intobeko and Tusi, who had the vision to create a cohort of healthcare workers who were being followed over time, looking at the development of COVID and relating that to the stage, the waves, remembering that the first wave was caused by the Wuhan, the original variant, the second wave, this time a year ago, the beta variant, and the third wave, the delta variant. And so this work was published as a letter in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and in fact, that collaboration became a much bigger story that was led by Wendy Burgers and many others here in the Institute, uh, including some brilliant young researchers, including Rowan Keaton, that demonstrated that past infection or prior infection with SARS-CoV-2 boosts and broadens the immunogenicity, in this case, of the J&J &J vaccine. And this took advantage of, uh, of the cohort study of Entobeco and Tusi, as well as the Sisonke trial. Very important implications for the design of next generation COVID-19 vaccines. And then finally, on the COVID front, uh, our researchers have collaborated extensively through NGSSA, this Consortium for Genomic Surveillance. Carolyn Williamson, who's here together with Darren Martin, worked together with Tulio de Oliveira, all funded by the national government through the MRC and the DSI, brought together laboratories from the NHLS to work together to actually go out and genome sequence the SARS-CoV-2. And so there was this stunning paper that was reported in Nature earlier this year, which was the second variant of concern, the beta variant first described from South Africa. And then Darren Martin did a really brilliant study in which he looked at millions of sequenced genomes of SARS-CoV-2 and was able to recreate the evolutionary history of the beta variant and other lineages and actually make some predictions of where that virus lineage may be evolving into the future. COVID-19, of course, has brought into sharp relief the need for vaccine self-sufficiency on the African continent. And so the Vice Chancellor hosted a very, a very interesting webinar a couple of weeks ago showcasing UCT's expertise in the vaccine space. And the Institute features in many of the pieces of that, uh, of that continuum. And here I want to highlight the fact that UCT has been very active in vaccines and diagnostics in Africa for Africa for a long time. This is the work of Ed Rabitz team. It is the most uh, prolific uh, per person who, who, who files patents, a great innovator in the Institute. He runs the biofarming research unit. And what do they do there? They express proteins in plants. They use plants as a manufacturing system for making vaccines and diagnostics. And here is a great review uh, by Manny Margoland and others from the Institute that basically portrayed and described the, the, the landscape across Africa. What is our capacity to engage in diagnostics, th therapeutics and vaccine research? And this in fact was published before the WHO announced the creation of these, these hubs uh, for vaccine manufacture, one of which is down the road here as the partnership between Afrigen and BioVac. This other paper, which is the work of Mohama Katza, a great student working together again with Wendy Burgers, highlights again our ability to make our own tools here and make them quickly. And this is one of several uh, SARS-CoV-2 diagnostics that were developed. Jonathan Blackburn, the deputy director of the Institute, has developed a very sophisticated system. But what this is, what's interesting about this particular paper, they use plant-expressed spike protein to develop a diagnostic which was used at a time in the pandemic when we had supply chain problems and when there were no commercially available tools. So we make our own research tools. 
Developing vaccines in Africa for Africa has been the vision and the mission of Annalise Williamson, a Saatchi Chair for Vaccinology. She has worked on HIV, papilloma virus, as well as vaccines for, for, uh, for animal diseases that, that impact upon livestock. And here is a great example of the use of so-called virus-like particles. These look like viruses, but in this case, they are decorated with a piece of the HIV, a protein from HIV, a core protein called the gag protein. And she has demonstrated, she and her colleagues have demonstrated the use of this kind of prime boost approach to enhance antibody responses in a vaccine prototype for HIV, also done again in close collaboration with the team at Caprisa. Um, biotechnology is the order of the day here in the Institute. Stefan Bath, who came from Fraunhofer in Germany and is a Saatchi chair here, has pioneered a technology called SnapTag. And what this does is it enables the production of anti-based uh, antibody-based diagnostics and therapeutic agents. And together with Nonhlantla Komala from the Department of Medicine, they are working together and using this kind of approach to develop personalized and targeted approaches in this particular case for skin cancer. And I think we're going to see a lot coming out of this uh, translation of this research uh, of this technology in the future. Now, up until now, I've talked about genomics of SARS-CoV-2, of tuberculosis, of HIV. In fact, genomics underpins everything that we do here in the Institute. And over the last 10 years, there's been an explosion in our interest and our understanding of the genomic makeup of African populations relations, human genomics. And here are two great studies, the first from Raj Ramasa's lab uh, with, uh, with um, Emil Chemusa and Nikki Mulder, describing and painting a portrait of so-called haplotype diversity and giving an idea of what are the signatures of selection on, an, on African populations that lead to their evolution. And this kind of work, understanding the genomic architecture of African populations, is a half of a new discipline called pharmacogenomics that merges together genomics and pharmacology. And it's, a, its aim is to try to ensure that when medicines are given, we optimize benefit and we minimize harm. And this is the work of Colette Dandara and his team of researchers, in this case, applying it to herbal med medicinal plants uh, in populations in health transition, critically important in our environment. All of the genomics work that I've talked about has been underpinned by this remarkable program that I feel very privileged to have started my term here when H3 Africa was just getting started. Tellingly funded by two northern uh, funding agencies, the Wellcome Trust and the US National Institutes of Health, took the strategic decision to invest in African researchers to build their own research programs. And here at UCT, we were great beneficiaries of H3A funding. Here are five members of this institute, three full members, two affiliate members who have applied uh, their, uh, who've applied genomics in their particular disease areas, be they communicable or non-communicable disease. And in fact, we have led here through Nikki Mulder, the H3A Bionet, and the entire coordinating center of H3 Africa is here uh, in this institute, as well as in the Department of Integrative Biomedical Sciences. H3A Bionet is a textbook example of building research capacity in Africa for Africa, led by the phenomenal Nicola Mulder, whose excellence as a researcher is surpassed only by her incredible humility. She is remarkable. If you would meet her, you wouldn't know what she's done. She's built a pan-African network across 17 countries, building capacity in data-intensive research on the continent. Through these four themes, trained thousands of people, trained trainers, built computer infrastructure, designed a chip for African populations that allows us to do genomics on African populations, ultimately empowering African scientists to manage and analyze their own data. We were delighted when the director of the NIH, Francis Collins, announced $75 million are going to be put into the DSI Africa program, data science for health discovery and, and innovation in Africa, and three major grants have come here to the Institute, and I'm delighted that Ambrose Wonkam is here. Nikki Mulder is now, will be leading the DSI Africa Open Data Science Platform. The entire coordinating center will be here housed in the Institute, and those who were here in person saw the new space in which this is all going to be accommodated. Ambrose Wonkam received a grant 
Focusing on public understanding of big, si of, of big data in the field of genomics, critically important. And Emil Chamusa working on computational omics and biomedical informatics. And talk about setting the agenda through thought leadership from Africa. Our former dean of, uh, deputy dean of research, Ambrose, who is here tonight, wrote not one but two opinion pieces in Nature this year that demonstrate thought leadership from Africa. In the first, he argued the case for why we should sequence three million African genomes, not just for Africa, these are human genomes, not just for Africa, for the world. And also he went out and argued the case for why sickle cell disease, which is a major cause, a major problem in, in, in Africa, why this should be the poster child for this kind of genomic med medicine that uses RNA therapy and gene therapy. So up until now, the vignettes that just give you a smattering of what's gone on in the Institute have been done by students, postdocs, and researchers working in member laboratories. But in addition to those 400 or 500 people at any point in time, we've had some bespoke programs. And what I'm showing you here is a gallery of stars funded through a program that Dani Fisser was instrumental together with Marilet Sinnott in launching at UCT. Through the Carnegie Corporation, they picked infectious disease as an important area. We gave fellowships to 45 people, PhD, postdoc, and early career fellowships. The the IDM actually pushed Carnegie into early career fellowships, nudged, let's say. And I look at this gallery today, I see a full professor, I see at least six associate professors, not only at UCT, one who's at Cambridge, one who's at UCSF. I see people who have created and done highly innovative things both at UCT and beyond. And Vice Chancellor, I feel that these kinds of programs in terms of building capacity is what institutes and universities like UCT are custom built to do. We are developing next generation researchers. In addition to that gallery of stars are these individuals who have gone out and won prestigious international fellowships from organizations as tough as it gets to win a senior fellowship as Graham Mankey's did, or as Sonwa Bile Zanibe won a training fellowship from the Wellcome Trust, who I'm privileged to serve as his sponsor. This is competitive. You're competing with the best in the world. And so this is another gallery of stars who've gone their own fellowships from tough international organizations, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, Gates Foundation, uh, the Crick Africa Network, the EDCTP. These are people who are now in UCT. Some have moved out. And I know that Mokhlopeni Marakalala is listening in from Durban. We spoke on the phone a short while ago. We miss you, Jackson, but I know he's doing very, very well at our sister in Institute in Ari in Durban, where his appointment is with University College of London. And Nikki Tiffin has now become a full professor at University of Western Cape. Just the best part of my job is writing letters of support saying, if you do, if you support this person, they will be based in an environment that offers this kind of critical mass, this kind of thought leadership. And I'd like to think that those letters, together with those from the Deputy Vice Chancellor, have got something to do with our success in this area. Graham Mankies has run another program, uh, funded in this case by the Fogarty International Center, building the next generation of research scholars who can tackle HIV-associated TB. Sadly, the COVID pandemic has set back our battle against tuberculosis and HIV. We need these people. This is a very diverse group of brilliant youngsters, clinicians, public health, laboratory scientists who are being trained in partnership with Johns Hopkins University and Vanderbilt University. As an institute, we've often asked, what can we do that an individual department can't do? So we have an acronym called TEAM, Transformation, Education, Advocacy and Mentorship. And these are the people from the Institute, EXCO and elsewhere, who have helped to run some amazing programs from mentorship, postgraduate student competitions. We've just launched a junior fellowship scheme here funded by the Institute. We've also run masterclasses. This is the brainchild of Clive Gray, who was on the Exco for 10 years and is now at Stellenbosch, also listening in today. What a masterclass does is we bring an expert to come and teach around, say, a new flow cytometer, and they come to UCT. And here was one example where Teng Leong Chu, 
the director of the Advanced Imaging Center from HHMI, Janelia, a world leading microscopist, came and ran a masterclass and got so enamored with UCT, we consider him actually an honorary member here, that he and Digby Warner imagined a program called Imaging Africa. Now, Imaging Africa, they raised funding from top international donors and got top microscopists to come to UCT just before COVID. There were 24 places. There were 714 applicants across the African continent for 24 places. It was a tough ask to decide who to get. There is a need, there is a demand, there is a hunger across Africa for training in basic sciences, in this case, around microscopy. And this is one of the most inspiring workshops that we've had here in the Institute, and we've run many. And in fact, the whole story was told in an article published in, in uh, Nature Methods earlier this year. We've also been invited as an institute, and I suppose one of the benefits of the pandemic, if one could call it that, is the webinar, the ability to listen from one's own cell phone often, listen in to top scientists from across the globe, sharing science globally. And the LSAG program that we are part of, we are one of eight sister institutes, the only one on the African continent. And this year alone, our vice chancellor participated in a great webinar on inclusion of underrepresented populations in science. And this was coordinated and convened by HHMI Genelia. And then we also had in, in August of this year, we organized a webinar around HIV cure with Linda Gale Becker and research stars from across the country, including Tumbi and Dungu, also from Ari uh, in Durban. Finally, we take community engagement very, very seriously. We call the social responsiveness at UCT so serious do we take it that this is the one of the four areas of activity by which our academics are judged. And here I could spend an hour telling you about what we've done in social responsiveness. And I've picked a couple of vignettes that I think epitomize the power of taking our research into communities. Ewaza, was started by Anastasia Koch with a small research grant from the research unit that I lead here. We gave her a few thousand rand. When she was a PhD student in 2013, today it is a non-profit organization, large organization funded by the Wellcome Trust and the NRF. And what they have done is taken youth and given them the tools of videography. And these youngsters make documentaries in their communities. The documentaries produced by Ewaza learners have been viewed more than a million times. And there are stories about themselves and their communities. And you can see Cheleka Mpande is giving a talk here in the Institute about TB vaccines to learners from Kailicha. And similarly, they're making documentaries in the laboratory, encouraging people with knowledge, empowering young people with knowledge. That's exactly the same principle of Joanne Passmore and Desmond Tutu Health Foundation, Wishing for Wellness, a program about empowering young women in Masipumalele to take ownership of their own bodies, of their own health when it comes to sexually transmitted infections, including HIV. And then the brilliant work that intersects art and science that I know Steve Reed would love. Uh, and this is the work from Michelle Tamaris and the Satvi group, who in fact won the UCT Social Responsiveness Award a couple of years ago, that brings art into the education around tuberculosis. And this slide would not be complete without showing you a tutu tester, which comes from the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation, taking health services into the communities. So we have doubled in 10 years and we've run out of space. And those who are present here today have seen the new buildings that have gone up. And this is my opportunity to publicly acknowledge my uh, partner in crime, Jonathan Blackburn has been the deputy director of the Institute for the last six years. This project is his brainchild. And Dr. Film Joacha, the deputy uh, director general of the Department of Science and Innovation, you honor us with your presence here tonight. Phil. So thank you for being here and thank you for giving funding, which we have contributed to as well, to create 1,500 square meters of new space that will be accommodating an advanced imaging center, a mass spectrometry facility, the data analysis center, and shared spaces in which people can work together and feed off each other. So in closing, Vice Chancellor, what are some of the lessons? I hope that I've been able to convince you that the strategy of building an interdisciplinary institute bottom up 
based on research niche, which sadly is disease burden in our situation, has been very successful in delivering high impact outputs. These are people and publications and outcomes, policy and practice. I have recognized and trust implicitly the brilliance of the people that I'm privileged to work with here. So instead of telling people what to do, we've taken our lead from the great scientists here who know how to move their science in the directions that it needs to move. And my job and that of the executive has been to support them in every possible way, paying very close attention to what the enablers are here. And I want to acknowledge the enablers, the people who don't get their names on papers. Our clinical research workers out in Kailicha or in Masipumalele, the technicians in the laboratories, the administrators, our finance and our HR staff, they are enablers. We could not do what we do without them. But there are also barriers. We're in a university that is organized along faculties and departments, and actually the power sits with heads of department, not with institute directors. Um, but uh, I have a lot of responsibility though. But essentially, when you're cross-cutting faculties and departments, you will encounter barriers. And when you're as fast moving as we try to be, we encounter barriers. And I want to acknowledge UCT has heard me when I have been really difficult and said you need to help us because this is not helping the research enterprise. So we sit in an environment where I think the university has helped us and has heard us. Work in progress, much more to do, but great to be based here. We are being prepared to, to take risks. We've invested in buildings. We've invested in infrastructure, PET CT scanners. I tell you, I've learned more about business than I ever wanted to know. I know how to write a killer business plan today, but it's important that one does that. We've invested in bioinformatics, and I have always asked, is the whole greater than the sum of the parts? Very important because we've got big groups that could drift off, but I do feel that the vignettes I've shared with you illustrate this. And then finally, there has been a great acceleration in the shift of center of gravity of thinking to the global south. And this is not just a shift, it's actually a tsunami that the, the pandemic has accelerated. And this signals an increasingly important role for strong research institutes and centers of excellence, such as the IDM over the next decade and beyond. We need to be ready to assume our role of leadership. The recognition of the gross inequities in global health, which have always been there. It's just that they were ignored. They have been brought tragically into sharp relief, has brought to the fore, and I think driving a rethink, certainly in the circles that I occupy when I deal with international colleagues, a rethink about what the concept of partnerships mean in global health research and being strong gives us, I think, a huge responsibility to ensure that the principles of equity, of equality, of fairness, of mutual benefit, and of joint ownership, not only of the story, but of the risks of the projects as well, we have a special, special role to play. This is occurring concomitant with a development called PPAP. I was on a panel with the Dean of the Harvard School of Public Health, Great Gates Grand Challenge meeting two weeks ago, where she inserted A into PPP public-private partnership. Academics belong in this space. We are interacting very closely with the public sector in particular. This is a complex space. We need to identify and define our roles and responsibilities in, in this space. It can be messy as we navigate. Similarly, there are huge movements that are happening in the world of research culture, science culture, research impact. How do we measure research and its impact? How do we judge that? How do we judge quality? And how do we judge and recognize and reward individuals and teams in an academy which valorizes individuals? These are major, major issues that UCT is grappling with, that the higher education sector is grappling with, that international funders are asking big questions about. And Vice Chancellor, I feel that as a university which is arguably the leading research intensive university on the African continent, we have a special role to play in grappling with these thorny issues moving forward. So I feel profound implications for UCT, its positioning moving forward. 
So let me just end by thanking so many people, the leadership of the university and the faculties of science and health sciences. You know who you are. Um, Marion Jacobs, Dani Fisser, uh, Greg Hussey, uh, Lionel, thank you so much for all your support. Ambroise, Simon Gordon, a special friend, my mentor. He is the chair of our scientific advisory committee, listening in from Oxford. He has an honorary degree from UCT as a UCT graduate and has done huge things for this university. My heads of department, not only are we friends and colleagues, we share collegiality and conviviality. In Tobacco, Raj Ramasa, Ed Sturrock, Jonathan, members of my EXCO, um, great people who have just helped to run this institute day to day, and special people, my team, the IDM directorate staff, they are the engine room of this institute. Again, unsung heroes, uh, who many of whom are sitting in the audience, and I think they're all listening because they know that they'd get a Mapola from me if they're not listening today. Uh, but Crystal, thank you for helping me to put together the data for this presentation. Today is a celebration about uh, the IDM community, our members, staff, po postdocs, and students who have given of their time, of their brilliance, of their passion for science and research, and members who have chaired committees, our underpinning structures, Yolanda Harley, the director of the faculty research office, a brilliant enterprise, the central research office, Darren Meyer, who's helped our finance, Heidi Starr, who's here, who's looked after HR. We are entirely soft funded. We're dependent on international and local funders and donors. And I hope there's some out there who are inspired to give to our mission. I am proud to belong to a university that takes COVID-19 vaccination so seriously. If you live in Cape Town and have not had your jab, please go to the UCT Community of Hope. It's a brilliant site. And then finally, I'm going to look at the screen and I'm speaking to my mother now. Mom, you know, when dad used to say to me, are you doing anything interesting and useful? My father passed away a year ago. If dad were alive today, I think he, the answer would be yes. Thank you, everybody. I said to you when I welcomed you that this is a celebration and that that's exactly what you did with us, Val. Um, shared with us 10 years of amazing work, contribution to our country, our community and the world, and mainly building, continuing to build a strong foundation, not only for the IDM and researching infectious diseases, but for the university exemplifying what it means to build a successful institute. I mean, in many ways, we can send all the young people who want to run institutes or research entities to the IDM to spend time with you, just to look through this, to learn about the challenges, the opportunities and the contribution that they can make. Of course, this is an example of what we're working towards in our Vision 2030 that's centered around the three pillars of excellence, transformation and sustainability. And we've shown that exceptionally well. The IDM is that. Where excellence lives is not just encouraged, is grown, is recognized, is valued, and it is used for something to help in the transformation journey. Because the transformation journey, I say to people, it's not just about employment equity. Oftentimes, when people talk about transformation, they ask, who have you hired? But it's also about asking the question, what is it, what is it that we are excellent in? What do we do it for? What is it for? As Chris Brink challenged us in, in his book. And this that you do is not a, just a contribution to scholarship in terms of infectious diseases. The work that you do spreads around the Cape Flats. It's all around communities that work with us, know it, experience it, value it, and the way you work with them, the IDM works with communities is exemplary, is exactly what we want. Of course, I've challenged uh, you before that next time I want to see their pictures also, the women in the communities um, uh, presenting with you, but it's really, really 
Excellent. Thank you so, so much for your leadership, um, for the contribution of the IDM, and for creating a possibility of a sustainable future, not just for IDM, but also for the university. Really, really grateful to have you as a leader of IDM 10 years down the line. Well, colleagues, thank you very much for joining us. I didn't recognize our DG, um, but you know, our DG, we go to him every time we want money. Uh, so Phil, thank you so much for joining us today. We're really grateful that you made the time to, to attend this, um, uh, not only as a colleague and, and uh, one of our principals, but also as a scientist who cares about the work that we do. Thank you very much for joining us. And colleagues, this kind of work doesn't just happen. There's a lot of people who make it happen. And I just want to thank, first of all, let me say thank you to the Wolfson Foundation. I mean, in many ways, this wouldn't happen if the Wolfson Foundation didn't invest in it. Thank you for believing in us. Thank you for investing in our work. Thank you for growing the excellence here. This is not just a contribution to UCT, it's a contribution to South Africa and the continent, not only for now, all those faces that you had, and then just who, who's, who's produced, but who you trained will continue to make a, 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 a difference elsewhere. But it's, it's, it's a big story that they were, they were educated here on the African continent. I also want to thank uh, colleagues in the uh, Department of uh, Alumni and Development. Uh, thank you very much, Sydney, for the work that you did to help us organize this. Really, really appreciate it. I also want to thank the Information and Communication and Technology Services uh, uh, ICTS for helping us with this. The fact that we didn't have to stop today and say, oh, they don't hear, they can't hear us and so on. Thank you very much for being patient with us and doing all of all of the work to get us um, all started. And let me acknowledge also the, um, our colleagues in CMD. They do a lot in the background. They don't get onto the stage, but they make sure that all of us are on the stage. Um, and, and I'm really grateful for the work that they do. And finally, let me acknowledge the staff of the Faculty of Health Sciences, led by Associate Professor Lionel Green-Thompson. Lionel and I were on duty all through the weekend, not only representing the university and, and sharing our thoughts, but also getting bitten for the university. Thank you for taking the beating with me uh, over the weekend, Lionel. It, it, was, it was, I felt, I felt we were a formidable uh, side. Thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone who does um, uh, who does the work in this faculty and the IDM. Thank you, colleagues. I think because we are in the pandemic, we are not sharing anything to eat. So we're going to share only um, smiles behind the masks after this. <laughs> but we really, really appreciate you joining us today in, a face -to in the face-to-face -face, um, uh, meeting. Have a good evening. <laughs>